So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Valeria Karablova. I am senior research fellow at Charles University that hosts today's event. This webinar is part of the Anti-War Marathon, an initiative of a group of scholars working at various institutions. And I thank Tatiana Shitsova for this initiative and for inviting us to join it. I shall start with some quick organizational remarks. This meeting is being recorded and by continuing to participate, we assume that you agree on that. The recording will be uploaded later and will be available online. The link will be posted in the discussion to this Facebook event. Every speaker will give a short opening statement. Afterwards, we will engage in a general discussion. You may pose your questions in the chat box or raise your hand afterwards. This discussion is meant to be held in Ukraine and in English, although we are open to, to your suggestions. And that would be to adjust to our audience, but also to reflect the multilingual character of our daily routine. We have a truly stellar set of speakers today whom I want to cordially thank for accepting the invitation. What all of them have in common, and that is a particular focus of today's conversation, is that they were caught by the Russian full-scale invasion in Ukraine while being outside of the country. The idea is to create this space to talk together about things that we are rarely asked about by journalists or speak in public namely to reflect on our personal experiences of the war and of our experiences of thinking about the war. In other words, I'm inviting you to reflect to some certain self-reflection endeavor. I would love to talk to you and with you about this experience of the war at a distance, so to speak, something that touches us deeply and immediately, yet is not experienced first-handedly. It is still a traumatic experience, I believe, which we might be ashamed to talk about as we find ourselves in a privileged position of staying in safe environments. But this trauma and this shame should be articulated. And the second line of thinking that I had in mind is that this very privileged, quote unquote, position of having direct access to several at least cultural environments might also open some opportunities for us not only to breach several cultures but also to try to generate some new meanings and interpretive models that might synthesize these different standpoints and maybe demonstrate broader reverberations of this war and its potential more universal readings. So I'm inviting the first speaker that would be Pan Mykola Rybchuk. Mykola Rybchuk is uh, a known public intellectual in Ukraine and one of the most important contributors to the post-colonial approach to Russian-Ukrainian relations. Currently, Pan Mykola is appointed as a researcher in the Institute of Advanced Studies in Paris, and it would be very interesting to hear про ваш особистий досвід проживання війни у Франції і про те, про досвіди включення в публічний простір французький, який видається досі центрованим цим наративом примирення, цими намаганнями посадити за загальний стіл для обговорення російських і українських інтелектуалів. Отже, пане Миколо, вам слово. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for, for inviting, for organizing this meeting and uh, for uh, gathering very nice uh, team of uh, scholars. Uh, yes, uh, the war caught me in Paris, uh, where I arrived in September with the hope to, to work uh, on another book within 10 months. Uh, the book, uh, ironically, was related to the today's event, even though I did not predict the all-out war, but it was about uh, so-called uh, Russo-Ukraine conflict, about narratives, about international geopolitical discourses on, the, on this so-called conflict. Uh, so I tried to, to examine different ideologies which uh, stand behind, behind these uh, discourses. Uh, now, of course, uh, the war uh, contributed some new uh, new motives, uh, new problems to, to, to my research, but, but generally I can continue it in the same line. Th there is another problem that uh, I'm, uh, since February I'm engaged in uh, uh, public relations, so to say, so there are very, very, very little time for 
for, for, for academic work, for library and so on, because I, I have to scroll down the news and I have to produce uh, uh, op-eds, various articles, uh, commentaries, uh, to give interviews, and sometimes to, to present lectures and uh, participate in round tables like today. So, so it's, it's quite, quite a challenge. Mm, and uh, for me, it's rather rather usual thing uh, because uh, I'm I'm workaholic. So <laughs> mm, uh, my, my wife says that it's a kind of of a survivor uh, complex. Uh, maybe yes, uh, survivor not not in terms of, of, of today's situation. Even even though we all are survivors here because we don't uh, are not threatened by Russian rockets and and uh, snipers and, and so on. So we are in a way we are lucky people. Uh, but we are also survivors uh, generally because most Ukrainians are survivors because we survived uh, many different calamities. My my mother's uh, family died out uh, during the f uh, famine of 1933. Uh, it was a big family and she, she was the only person uh, within that family who survived. Mm, the same with my uh, mother-in-law. So really it's uh, kind of, kind of uh, survivor's nation. And of course, uh, probably not only myself, but also many people feel a sort of obligation, sort of, of duty to work not only uh, for, for, for themselves, but also, also on behalf of all these people who perished and who cannot uh, contribute to, to our today's struggle, to our eventual victory, I believe. Uh, so yes, uh, I, I have no holidays, I have no, uh, no, take no rest, it's really, very hard, uh, hard duty, but but rather it's rather rather usual thing for me. Uh, the war, of course, um, uh, complicated many things, and uh, I, I I I planned, for example, to to travel uh, more often uh, in Ukraine as I did, for example, in 2013 14. Uh, when I was also caught, ironically, <laughs> at the time, 10 years ago, I also arrived to Vienna for a very similar fellowship, uh, also with another hope to, to write a book uh, within 10 months. And there was Euromaidan, so at the time, again, I had to, to be engaged in the writing op-eds and, and uh, talking uh, in PR relations. But it was, of course, uh, easier because uh, country was open and we could could shuttle here and back and it really um, was more uh, was not uh, so threatening so 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 dangerous so uh, sinister as, as it is today uh, so um, uh, yes we we have very very difficult task we, we, we feel this duty to uh, to work harder than ever uh, France is a very peculiar country because, yes, indeed, it's, it's a society which never, never understand, never recognized, never cared about Ukraine too much. It was Moscow-oriented traditionally because of uh, imperial affinity, because of many traditional historical uh, contacts and, and uh, traditions and so. Um, but it changes. I must say that, you know, it, it, uh, maybe not radically, it's not as... Uh, as not seaside sea changes as, as elsewhere, but but still it's noticeable. Um, I couldn't uh, imagine so, so, so huge attention to to Ukrainian development before in French media, newspapers, TV. I couldn't imagine for Eiffel Tower uh, colored in blue and yellow. Uh, colors of Ukrainian flag and on and on. Yes, it's, it's really impressive and sometimes it's moving, but also, of course, there are a lot of misunderstandings. There are a lot of this, you know, uh, uh, Putin first air, so to say, uh, who try to, to muddle the water, who try to, again, to promote this idea of reconciliation, you know, dialogue, and all this, you know, traditional blah, blah. Uh, and of course, also another motive, which is very often emerges here, maybe not so often, but emerges from time to time, emerges in mass media, in public discourses, a uh, motive of Ukraine's uh, far right, Ukraine's fascism, uh, which is, uh, uh, of course, we understand where it comes from, but still it's, it has some, uh, support and uh, draw some attention. It's very difficult to, to fight it uh, back. Um, so yes, we, we do whatever, we, well, as much as we can. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a single Ukrainian here and uh, not a single specialist in Ukrainian uh, field, but of course it's not as, as developed as in the United States or even UK or, or Germany, not to mention Poland or uh, some, some other uh, East European countries. 
so yes and no. My, my, my impression is rather uh, ambivalent. Uh, on the one hand, I, I am really I really appreciate uh, support from my French colleagues. I, I, I appreciate support of, from Ukraine, uh, French society, which appeared to be very open and, and uh, friendly for Ukrainians. But also, of course, uh, my big concern is that this knowledge is uh, uh, insufficient and quite uh, quite marginal. Uh, uh, France is still more <laughs> more um, interested in the south than in the east of, of, of the continent, uh, which is maybe understandable, but uh, of course, uh, today's Ukraine situation is, is quite unique. It's really maybe it's the only actually it's the only war within the past 80 years, and it's the only war uh, which is uh, absolutely um, unprovoked and, and, uh, and uh, carried out by the external aggression. It's, it's, a, it's a really unique situation which deserves uh, not only support, but also deserves a very powerful response because it creates very dangerous precedents for the future, for the stability in the uh, entire world. So, so much for a while. Thank you so much for this inspiring message that the situation has been changing in France, despite all the sort of resistance you know to accept this reality at least as a first reaction and also thank you for making this link between the Maidan and the current war which is I believe quite obvious for Ukrainians but is completely missed by external observers or at least to a large extent and of course this remark that we are a nation of survivors that Ukrainians are usually very efficient in crisis mobilization and uh, otherwise failing to have this unity under the peaceful conditions. So thank you, I hope we will continue to follow up on that, but uh, right now we will move from France to Sweden, and I want to give the floor to Dr. Yulia Yurchuk. Uh, Yulia is now based in Sweden, University of Amea, and is a historian working in the field of memory studies. So I wonder, you have worked a lot about historical, historic traumas and and therefore you have a proper analytical toolkit to analyze traumatic experiences. So I wonder if it is of any use under the current conditions and maybe uh, you would find it possible to talk about your own personal experience. I can start with my personal trauma. I remember being invited to comment live in the news uh, at Czech television scene and Prima, it was on Saturday, February 20. Sixth, and I was astonished by my bodily reaction. Somehow I could not hear properly. I had this tunnel vision and all that I know, it is a traumatic response on the physical level when your psychic system is working like in a very specific mode. And later on, I was talking to colleagues also best in, based in different Western institutions and some of them lost their appetite after reports from Bucha and Mariupol. Some were scared of flying airplanes and any like loud sounds and so on, which certainly testifies to a sort of trauma, which is should not be compared to trauma of those who are currently in Ukraine. However, I believe that uh, talking about that does not diminish other traumas, but rather it show, exposes the scope of traumatic experiences we will have to deal with later. So if if anything from of that resonates with you, please comment on that. The floor is yours, Julia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Valeria. And thank you for everyone for uh, joining us. And thank you for all the speakers. It's really my honor to be with you today. And uh, uh, as a scholar who is uh, studying memory, I, I feel like um, <laughs> really everything I read before now experiencing myself. It's a very uh, kind of strange situation. And uh, all this tunnel vision and all these traumatic responses, uh, they they switched on directly on the 24th of um, February. And I lived through this kind of four days, which I couldn't even remember how they passed. And then I uh, started eating again and I started functioning again. And, uh, I, of course, understood what is happening, but uh, uh, still being in this situation is very, very hard. And I cannot even imagine what people on the ground were uh, going through. And uh, for some, it's not ending after two months, after eight years, right? Uh, and it's uh, it's just horrible to, to think about all this. And I will maybe continue uh, by 
linking what uh, Mikola Repchuk just said about this survival strategies, because uh, even the, the uh, science, the science of uh, like, you, you know, this neuroscience is saying us that memory is kind of um, evolutional mechanism. We, we survive because we have memory, we, we have memory how to survive. And uh, this war also, uh, also showed on the example of my family, how this uh, memory mechanisms as survival work. Because in my family, uh, I was optimistic. I still, um, I still hoped that uh, the big invasion won't happen. But my husband, he was prepared. He, he already bought everything, what he thought he would need when the war will start. So when uh, the 24th of February came, uh, we already had a lot of uh, like military stuff at home. And we, we could really directly send everything to Ukraine. And uh, that was uh, exactly at that moment that I thought that uh, this is kind of memory in work. So th this is like, he was prepared that Russia will be ready for this war. And then I spoke to one of my friends and she said, you know what, I was waiting for this war from 1939. Of course, she was not even born then, but her uh, grandmother uh, went through all the war. She was in this um, underground resistance, uh, underground army in Ukraine, you all know UPA, right? And uh, she, this grandchild now, she said, I was waiting for this war. I knew it will come, but I didn't know when. So I think this, uh, this shows a lot about how our collective memory even works, not only memory of uh, one individual. And uh, uh, when the war, this big war uh, happened, uh, started, uh, um, as I said, I was a bit like lost for several days. And uh, the only thing I could think about was that what I can do, I can be kind of a platform for Ukrainian voices. And a lot of people from Ukraine, my friends from Ukraine were messaging me and, uh, and asking, you should write that, you should write this, you should, because they believed like, if I am in the West, then I can kind of say the truth to, to the West, which is of course exaggerating my power. But I, I did what I could. I, I just uh, write what I could. And the, the first thing what I did um, publicly was to organize a film screening of Irina Tzilik's um, film, because I thought that uh, this is exactly the time when Ukrainian voices has to be heard. And this is also interesting because I was contacted by the university and they asked me to um, think about something what can be interesting for the audience to tell something about Ukraine. And uh, they asked me, maybe it can be Lasnitsa's film. And I said, but why Lasnitsa? Why, my goodness, we have so many other good uh, directors and and of course, they didn't have anything bad in their mind. They 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 really wanted something Ukrainian. And uh, I said, uh, yeah, if you want something Ukrainian, I will do something, but it won't be Lesnitsa. And uh, it was uh, the first uh, the the first public event that uh, I organized. And then I kind of started uh, going uh, to some media to write something. And uh, um, what also helped that we with my husband we organized the um, collecting money campaign and we we really uh, collected so much money for a couple of days we collected uh, uh, 100,000 um, krona which is 10,000 uh, uh, euro it's not a lot but for one individual it's a lot and then we, we had a call from our bank and they said you should stop it so it also tells a lot about sweden right you should stop it because uh, you as an individual you cannot do it because we cannot trace the money so for, for sweden it's very big deal to not be able to trace the money so we said but we are ukrainians they said 
that we understand you very well, you are Ukrainians, but please don't do it because it's uh, not okay. You have to have some kind of company or NGO or something to do it. Uh, but uh, yeah, but it helped for the first uh, weeks, uh, like for us. But I also understand that, uh, like, to be a volunteer, it's like a full time job, really. And I appreciate all the people who are doing it because my husband had to take uh, leave for one month to do it because it was not possible to to combine with any kind of work. And if we at the university are working, you know, kind of uh, the load we have of all this teaching, it's not possible to, to combine with anything. So I really appreciate now all the volunteers, what, who, what they are doing. It's just amazing, really. And um, like, of course, uh, uh, me, uh, I was studying this nationalist movement, right? I was studying the memory of nationalist movement. I was studying what what Russia made into the cause of war, right? And uh, my reaction to all the uh, media, I, I just said that I won't comment it because, uh, uh, I mean, all these years, for eight years, we were trying to convince like everyone that Ukrainians are not like Nazis. If we are even uh, like waving the flags of uh, red and uh, black, it, it doesn't mean that we are Nazis. And you all know this, right? My whole dissertation is about like why, why uh, democratic forces in Ukraine are using the memory of undemocratic uh, movement of the Second World War. So, I, I, but uh, I, I, I decided that it's not uh, really relevant now to even speak about it because you kind of will um, um, promote this um, kind of very crazy Putin's uh, Russian logics uh, in uh, into the media agenda. And uh, as far as I know, all my colleagues who were asked about this Nazism and the Nazis in Ukraine, they all said no. So there was no discussions on uh, Swedish media about this. And I must say that for Sweden, I think that I was lucky enough that I am in Sweden because the Sweden is kind of, um, united and uh, in solidarity with Ukraine. And I think here history and memory also take uh, like, uh, uh, plays a role because in Sweden there is this huge uh, kind of feeling uh, of um, the uh, what uh, it's called like a Swedish um, uh, Russian Russian fear like they are afraid of Russians like historically they are afraid of Russian is an um, um, enemy and uh, I think that dur during this war in Ukraine they finally saw that uh, it also can be a threat to them and. Um, so it was not the situation like in uh, Germany or in France, uh, it was more a united solidarity, which I saw. And um, I'm very happy that all my friends also uh, supported me to survive, at least uh, during these first weeks, which were very, very hard. And um, also, I think that um, uh, what, uh, what, what, what is also interesting for me and what is important for me in Sweden to see that all the universities are also united in solidarity with uh, Ukraine and I didn't see this kind of programs which are addressed um, equally to, to Ukrainian students and to Russian students. We have uh, really like um, separate uh, politics towards uh, Ukrainian students, Ukrainian researchers. And um, I think this is important also. Yeah, I can stop here and we'll proceed. Many thanks, Yule, for, for doing what you have been doing together with your husband and especially for sharing about it now. Uh, I hear from you and I believe that it's valid for many of us that doing something like very practical and very like with very obvious results, it's a very good recipe to kill this anxiety and these sort of traumatic uh, weird states of mind. And that brings me to the next speaker who would be my uh, fellow colleague from Charles University, Radomir Mokrik. Uh, Radomir had lived in Prague for a while and I would say uh, had been very well integrated in the Czech society. However, after February 24th, he made a decision to go back to Ukraine. 
And now he, as, as he mentioned before, now he writes prolifically for Czech media, some like big, you know, enlightenment style articles about Ukraine. So Radomir, if you would like to share how you made this decision and uh, how it feels from inside in Ukraine, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting me. Actually, I'm as it was said, uh, in a bit uh, different situation because actually, uh, really, I'm in Ukraine from the very first day of the war. Uh, but I do write a lot uh, and I'm trying to explain what is going on in um, the Czech medias. So I would probably, I would like to say just a couple of words as I do see this, this narratives and what is um, going on in uh, Czech public opinion and medias first of all and then probably share some uh, personal uh, things about it uh, so um, first of all I do think that um, uh, as it was said actually as Yulia Yurchuk said I think it's a uh, very right uh, time for Ukrainian voice to be heard so and I do think that it's the right time to at least try to explain that uh, this war is um, is a colonial war, actually, and this and that this war is just uh, another level, another chapter of Russian war against uh, Ukraine to explain the origins and the reasons of um, of the current war. Because, um, as I do see, um, for example, in Czech Republic, there are a lot of people who still uh, still think that it's about uh, like NATO threat or some biological weapons and so on and so far uh, <clears throat> so i do think that this is the right moment to uh, to write something yeah as you said enlightenment uh texts and to explain the the deep origins historical and cultural um origins of uh, this conflict and that's exactly what i'm just trying trying to do uh right now i haven't seen a lot of uh articles in uh, czech media uh working with this uh, narrative uh but i'm pretty convinced that this is uh the right approach uh right now for us uh first of all of course uh some of these texts uh, were published uh in the west for example uh timothy snyder i guess just a couple of days ago in the New Yorker published um, an article about the colonial essence of uh, of this war uh, and it's of course it's good to stress that like you see Professor Snyder or Professor Plochy just published an article about the the Russian colonialism so this is the right approach and I, I guess uh, it's important to work with it right now uh, because otherwise it could uh, it could happen uh, that the West, the public opinion in the West, people in the West will think that this is Putin's war. And this is uh, uh, absolutely, this is not correct. And this is even dangerous. I think it's important to, to explain that this is Russians, uh, Russians war um, in, uh, in Ukraine. So this is uh, the first thing. The second is uh, when I, uh, look at social medias for example in czech republic i do see that probably the main narrative of uh russian propaganda uh looks like um like who knows uh everyone lies so uh, we do not know what what actually is going on in ukraine and so on and so far <coughs> i have this uh advantage uh being in ukraine for uh last weeks uh, now I'm in Lviv, but uh, I've visited Kyiv for a couple of times. I've been to uh, Bucha, I've been to Borodyanka, I've been to Irpin, I've seen all these uh, graves, I've talked to local people. Um, I've been in the houses where uh, actually Russians were living for, for a couple of weeks. Uh, tomorrow actually we are leaving to, uh, to Odessa because it seems like this beautiful city could be uh, uh, the next target of uh, Russian Russian aggression, and I will try to uh, to see uh, what's going on in the city and to talk to uh, 
to people there. So it's uh, what I'm trying to say. It's um, extremely important to uh, to have this argument here yeah, that I've been here, I've seen this. I have relatives there. I have friends uh, in these these cities, and so this information is relevant and 100 correct. Yeah, because you can just you can just argue that you've seen it by your own eyes, or at least you have uh, some some relatives there. Uh, this is about the information of war. And um, the third uh, important thing, I guess, it's what actually sounded here uh, two times about the Nazis. Uh, uh, yes, in Czech Republic, this uh, uh, Nazi narrative uh, is uh, still rather strong because when I, uh, when I was uh, on the TV in Czech Republic, um the main actually uh, uh, tv um, <clears throat> programs in czech republic uh all the time every time journalists uh, were asking me uh, about like yeah okay we understand but what about the nazis what about azov yeah and like geez are you serious yeah if we are talking about mariupol yeah we are talking about this great disaster that is going on right now online but the question still is, okay, this Azov battalion, so what, what is wrong with them? And um, so I, uh, I do understand that it's, uh, it's really annoying nowadays uh, to, take, um, to take part in such a discussions, uh, but I, I do think that it's still important uh, right now to, to talk and to explain uh, this, why Russia is using this Nazis fascist narrative and uh, actually to explain that uh, Russia itself probably now gained uh, some features of uh, Nazi state much more than uh, Ukraine if we are talking about Nazi ide ideology and so on and so far. So these are probably this uh, uh, three key points uh, that I that I was going to share with you um, about this media discourses in uh, in Czech Republic as I do uh, do see it. Uh, what about my personal experience? I actually, you mean the, the first day days of the war? I um, I actually do not know what to say because because I just uh, realized in some sense after this Putin's speech the the February twenty uh, second uh, yeah I guess uh, two days before the full scale scale invasion it was uh, this um, horrific uh, speech by by Russian uh, president and I just realized that probably this is the right time to to come home yeah and and that's it and I'm uh, actually absolutely happy about the decision because uh, I think it's extremely uh, complicated, I mean, and emotional uh, to, to be abroad, to stay abroad while such things are going in, uh, in Ukraine. And uh, I'm just happy to be here. That's it. Thank you, Radko. That was like really very moving when you said that it was time to go back home after being like well integrated in in the Czech society as I mentioned before and again you pointed out the same that Yulia mentioned these persistent narratives of Kremlin propaganda that we should not engage altogether even to discredit them because by the very fact of talking about that seriously we validate them so it's still an open question how to uh, struggle how to fight how to combat this propaganda in the most efficient way but since we talk a bit about media, I think it, it's very logical to turn to Biktur Iskander now. I met Biktur quite a few years ago in Prague Civil Society Center, and I was impressed by his Ukrainian language skill and by his personal engagement into the Ukrainian case. And for me, it was very important to invite Biktur to this conversation, because we Ukrainians these days talk a lot about the need to decolonize our thinking and our practices, but at the same time, our thinking remains largely Eurocentric. And I believe that we ignore Central Asian context altogether. And since Victor 
comes from Kyrgyzstan, I think it's, it would be very useful for us to hear his take. He's a very active uh, civic entrepreneur and a founder of Claw Project of Investigative Journalism, which covers developments in the region. Also, he gives TED Talks and he um, works with me with audience and social media quite efficiently. So I see how he promotes the idea of decolonization and what harsh resistance he meets with his audience. So if you would like to share something about that, Victor, we, we will appreciate that. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Do you hear me well, by the way? Yep. yep. Uh, thank you, Valeria. I should add that my Ukrainian has become even better since last mm -hmm. time we met. Also, because I moved to Ukraine last year, actually, and I've been living in Kiev, and I still uh, pay for my rent for my apartment in Kiev. Although I am currently not in Ukraine, but I left Ukraine to return. This is a complicated story, but I'll come back to that a bit later. And as Valeria mentioned, I'm from Kyrgyzstan. I'm one of the founders of a media organization called CLOB. Uh, and we've been mostly famous for our work in Kyrgyzstan. But at some point, I started having this very, very strong connection with Ukraine. I first traveled to Ukraine in 2010, when I was an observer at uh, presidential elections, uh, where Yanukovych won, unfortunately. And um, I was uh, an observer in Donetsk. So Donetsk was my first Ukrainian city, uh, which was quite an experience, I should say, because, uh, I, I mean, I'm now I feel like... Uh, I'm, I was happy to see Donetsk how it was before, you know, the war started in 2014, uh, because then it made much more sense for me uh, when following, you know, what was happening after that to actually understand deeper the context of uh, how things were developing. And uh, I would return to Ukraine many times. And uh, I don't even know how many times I have been in Ukraine, but this is definitely the country where I spend most of my time, except for Kyrgyzstan, my home country. Uh, I witnessed most of historical events. Uh, I was a journalist at Euromaidan. Uh, I covered the war when it started in 2014. I was in Donetsk in May 14, uh, when the war broke out, uh, shortly after it had been broken out. And then I returned to uh, occupied territories uh, of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk uh, regions. I've been to 12 regions of Ukraine. So um, I think I can say that I probably learned Ukraine pretty well, you know, uh, I've been to so many places. And then uh, at some point I decided, okay, it's probably time to live in Ukraine because I really love the country. And uh, what we plan to do with our organization is to build a safety hub in Kiev for Central Asian journalists. Uh, we started working on that last year. The idea was that we would bring um, some of the bravest uh, investigative journalists from Central Asia to Ukraine. Uh, first of all, uh, so that they would be able to live in a safer space uh, without a fear of being attacked or arrested and also to build more networks between journalists of Ukraine, also of Belarus, who, uh, and there were many journalists from Belarus in Kiev uh, since 2020, uh, and also to start building, you know, these networks of what I call post-colonial solidarity, because uh, one of the reasons why I have been traveling to Ukraine so much and why I decided to move to Ukraine was because uh, Ukraine has always been a very inspirational example for me as a person from Kyrgyzstan, a country which actually has a very similar historical context when it comes to, to colonization. I mean, we were colonized by the same empire. We went through similar horrifying practices that Russians would do against us. Uh, we had the same history of our native languages being, you know, um, limited. <laughs> I mean, probably... I should use stronger words about that, but anyway, and um, and and that's and at the same time, what I was feeling really sad about is that since we became independent, uh, there was not so much interest in Kyrgyzstan about Ukraine and about what was going on, uh, and well, the same actually happened in Ukraine because uh, whenever I would um, come to some public event or give a give a give a talk somewhere in Ukraine. Quite often, I would be the first person from Kyrgyzstan that my audience would ever meet. But then when we would start talking and when we would start sharing 
uh, our experiences, ranging from current experiences, but also to experiences that were shared with, with us by our parents, grandparents, and so on, we would be amazed by, first of all, how much of a common pain we share, but at the same time, how much of common achievements we do have. And uh, I decided at some point that I would want to dedicate some significant part of my life to uh, building you know, this platform, which would allow us to exchange the best practices that our countries had since we became independent, uh, to build much more cooperation on the grassroots level between the civil societies of Kyrgyzstan and Ukraine, and not only Kyrgyzstan and Ukraine. I mean, whole Central Asia is interesting, you know, and uh, Caucasus countries are very interesting as well. Uh, we understand each other so well uh, when we start speaking to each other. So uh, first, I, my idea was to solve this problem that we should start speaking to each other, you know. Um, and uh, I was in Ukraine when this full-scale invasion started. Uh, I didn't want to leave Ukraine um, because, you know, I still had these plans of safety hub in Kiev and so on. Then my colleagues told me, okay, you know, probably safety hub in Kiev is not happening this year. Uh, let's temporarily do it in Poland, maybe. And then we'll move it back to Ukraine, you know, when Ukraine is safer. But uh, let's do something else. Let's actually bring Central Asian journalists to Ukraine to cover the war. Something to what I have personally done in, similar to what I have personally done in 2014, 2015, but on a larger scale. And in order to organize it, you probably should leave Ukraine first to collect resources. That's what they told me. To collect resources, you know, to uh, organize everything to prepare yourself and also uh, journalists who you want to bring and so on. Um, and um, so, yeah, I had to leave Ukraine in order to start preparing for this. And I'm coming back in a month, I hope, uh, when we gather this group of journalists, because currently there are zero journalists from Central Asia in Ukraine. And at the same time, what has been going on in Ukraine since 2014 has been affecting our country so much because when Russia understood that it's losing its influence on Ukraine's domestic politics, for example, it switched a lot of attention to us. They started promoting some insane legislation in my country. Uh, they tried to promote the same uh, law on foreign agents, which fortunately our parliament members voted against. Uh, they started interfering a lot into, you know, the way our society is structured and i hate it uh and i really want to fight against it and i at the same time want to explain to people in my country what actually is going on in ukraine i want to change this narrative i want i want to free my people from this influence of russian propaganda which unfortunately is quite strong in kyrgyzstan and um yeah so basically this is my main one of my main missions right now is to gather uh journalists from kyrgyzstan and kazakhstan as well in Poland first to get them prepared, to equip them with all the necessary safety gear and then board a train to Lviv and then to Kiev. And then um, they will go wherever they think they will need to go. I will stay in Kiev and save them in terms, in case they need it. Basically, this will be my job, but uh, I can't wait for it to happen because um, um, I mean, since, you know, this full-scale invasion started, I was, of course, horrified by what was going on. Uh, and as I said, I didn't want to leave Ukraine. Uh, and uh, I was, uh, I, I had to go to Poland first. And um, uh, I, I was absolutely losing interest to everything that was going on, except, uh, you know, uh, uh, except for what was going on in Ukraine. Um, and. Um, now, when I'm when I have this motivation of coming back, this really makes me happy, and I can't wait for the day when I cross the border and enter Ukraine. Um, and I hope that uh, it will change a lot in terms of you know this post-colonial solidarity, which I think should only become stronger between our countries. I think I would end here. Thank you so much. What a sad irony that you imagined Kyiv as a safety hub for Central Asian journalists, but I hope someday it will. I mean, I cannot sympathize enough with the whole project of post-colonial solidarity that different colonial subjects of the Russian Empire should somehow stick together and learn from each other.
Very important. And also this uh, personal touch that you are still paying your rent in Kyiv that really moved me. So that's a very nice kind of uh, feature. Sorry, I disappeared for a while. Uh, did you hear me till the end or? Yes, I yes, don't know. yes. It was like perfect timing of disappearing because once you disappeared, I started talking. So I think we're okay. Thank you. <laughs> like playing together quite well. So thanks again for your input here. Uh, and we are moving now from media to the cultural domain. And I want to give the floor to Antonina Stebur. Uh, who is now based in Berlin, the Berlin University of the Arts. Antonina is an art critique and curator. And um, I wonder how, how, are, how these interests click. I believe that the Ukrainian dimension of war or the Ukrainian experience of war is very strong emancipatory and decolonial dimension. So I wonder from your perspective, how these experiences of resistance in Belarus and Ukraine converge here, and also how these resistances may be reflected in cultural production. So Antonina, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, the place I'm speaking from is very problematic, or maybe problematic is not very good words, uh, but maybe it's uh, very complicated. Because uh, as uh, Valeria said, I am from Belarus, but the last year I lived uh, in Kyiv uh, because uh, I left Belarus because of the political repression. And now I'm uh, right now I'm in Warsaw. Yes, but I'm going to move to Berlin uh, in university. But um, I totally, uh, we, uh, in the Belarusian context, we very often compare Belarusian protest and uh, the war, but for me, it's very uncomparable uh, things. Because uh, in my in my personal uh, perspective, I can say that uh, during the protest, the Belarusian protest 2020, 2021, I wrote many texts. I was very active in research and criterial point of view. I Mm, I took part in, uh, I don't know, many discussions, and it was vice versa uh, when the war started, uh, because I, I was in gaze and numb, I can't, I can't, I couldn't uh, write anything, I couldn't uh, took part in any discussion, and to tell the truth, at my first uh, public discussion of the war, because uh, I felt myself as I lose language at all. And uh, uh, so, and as uh, Julia said, I also paid attention in volunteer works. And of course, uh, as Valeria said, uh, uh, it was amazing for me um, how uh, this structure of help or structure of resistance that we created as Belarusians during the protest or even uh, earlier, because, for example, when we speak about uh, Belarusian independent soldiers then took part in war um, on the side of Ukraine, uh, there uh, troops uh, named by the Belarusian revolutionary uh, Kasus Kalinovsky, who fought against the Russian invasion in Belarus. Uh, these uh, troops uh, also took part, uh, not the same uh, people, but um, like uh, infrastructure, took part uh, in the beginning of the war. I mean, I mean in uh, 2014 in Donbass and Lugansk, uh, also uh, with uh, the Ukrainian soldiers. And so uh, when the war started, they uh, also uh, rare, um, how to say, reverse and to take to took part uh, and take part now in uh, uh, with uh, Ukrainian soldiers. But as for me, I also, uh, during the Belarusian protest also, um, uh, did a lot of uh, activistic work because my uh, my curatorial and research uh, focus uh, is uh, connected with activistic pre practice in contemporary art. So I connected before I had I had a huge connection with human rights organization and uh, activists uh, movements not only in Belarus. And uh, during the Belarusian protest, we created uh, the well, with uh, lawyers, uh, human rights organization, and IT specialists, uh, we created uh, 
call center for survival, um, uh, for survivors. And uh, uh, unfortunately, before, uh, in the end of uh, 2021, uh, we frozen it, uh, this project. And of course, when the war started, we uh, also reopened this project. We found uh, um, NGO in Ukraine. It, 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 it is a Yevromaidan source and the center of uh, civil initiatives. And together we created the same call center for victims, for survivors, uh, um, to, to help uh, you know, that they can uh, get information and can help to find right initiatives uh, for helping, for evacuation and so on. So, and uh, I can, uh, I really took part and I can see, but I unfortunately, as Julia say, uh, to work as a volunteer, to work as an activist, it means it's like a full, full-time job. Uh, I haven't enough time uh to to reflect it to i i haven't i haven't distance to think about it uh, in uh like a researcher not, not like activist and uh, mm, so uh to tell the truth uh, i'm focused on help i was focused on helping how how we can help moreover mm, uh, ukraine was uh, the the first place uh, country where belarusians um uh, where Belarusians right away the uh, Lukashenko regime and uh, escape their political repression. Uh, so, and today there are many Belarusians uh, uh, stay in Ukraine or um, today on the border help uh, help with uh, um, migrants and refugees and so on. And uh, so it's amazing how this infrastructure of care, infrastructure of helping and infrastructure of resistance uh, that was existed during the Belarusian protest or even earlier, as I mentioned, uh, then can uh, adopt it very fast to the Ukraine, to the situation of war. And as my colleagues, I totally, I totally sure that this war is, uh, colonial war and uh, this uh, because uh, Russia took part or not started uh, the war around uh, uh, its country uh, from uh, 90s uh, and uh, to, to try to uh, to try to uh, manage other countries to control them and uh, I, I Belarus is a is also an example how uh, more or less that this country not occupied by um, how to say the 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 euro but they occupied it de facto de facto and so it's very important to reflect in this point of view as um, um, so it's very important to uh, to reflect about in this term uh, so and what's uh, uh, and maybe uh, only several men maybe only several weeks ago i found my uh, my um, i don't know i found uh, time and i found language to start to think about all the situation uh, because uh, together with my ukrainian colleagues uh, who also works in contemporary art we created uh, anti war coalition art it means that international collection of cultural work is again the war in Ukraine. It's uh, some like is an open online platform uh, that collected uh, and shares statements, uh, contemporary art statements against war created by artists from all over the world. And that's very important for us because our goal is uh, uh, to show that this war is a more complex, uh, has uh, their very complex global context. Uh, and uh, so it's very important. It was very important for us that uh, in this plot, in this coalition, enjoyed many artists, not only from Ukraine, but also from all over the world, from, from for example, from Latin uh, American countries, or for example, from um, Serbia um, or um, Bosnia, because it helped us to understand this very, or, or for example, from Georgia, because they, as uh, Bektur said, we have uh, um, like uh, Kyrgyzstan or for example, Georgia or, 
Belarus and Ukraine, we have uh, the strong common uh, colonial context. So, and that's I think that it's very important to uh, to think about it and to um, to discuss it uh, because it helps understand that it's not uh, like. Um, it's, uh, it helps to understand that it's not only um, that it's, how to say, it's systematic uh, action that made Russian. Uh, it's not uh, like just one, uh, one war. This war started, the, the uh, series of war that started from 90s. And uh, to tell the truth, if uh, we can say it started uh, much more earlier. Uh, from the from the beginning of this uh, country, so it's very uh, important to understand and to get together this experience and to think about it. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Antonina, uh, for your input. Again, I heard this uh, sort of confirmation of the war as a traumatic experience because you said that the first reaction after the war, it was like a radical impossibility to continue your professional activities as usual, right? So the first reaction is that we do not that do not have that space for slow thinking, distant thinking to produce whether academic or cultural projects, right? And therefore we engage in some practical here and now volunteer or other uh, initiatives. And now I will turn to Katarina Batanova, who is a co-curator of the cultural Festival sound, uh, Culturescapes in Basel, Switzerland, and a uh, public intellectual with a sound voice in Ukraine and beyond. And um, we keep talking, I hear it from every speaker, that, in, that it is definitely a colonial war. However, we do not know how to overcome this post-colonial reading in the West, which is not necessarily pro-Russian, but often is Russia mediated or using the knowledge produced in Russia on Ukraine. And when I was listening to this excellent panel in Warsaw last Friday that you participated in, Katerina, uh, you were sharing your experience, how you talk to your uh, fellow intellectuals in the West, that for them, this scale of tragedy is just too hard to swallow. And maybe the right approach for to reach out to them, to, to close, like to open up this hermetic domain is not to suggest some big theoretical concepts or abstract visions, but rather to go to personal experience that could resonate with them personally. So if you could further elaborate on that, I would, I'm curious to hear more. Katerina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you very much for organizing this meeting, which uh, at least for me is a very therapeutical experience. You know, we're talking about trauma. We have to take care of trauma and talking to people, uh, most of whom I, I know and um, deeply respect and also miss because we haven't seen each other uh, for quite some time. Uh, it is very healing and it's very helping. And um, I also think it's very, um, again, therapeutical to be able to speak with people with whom we don't have to explain to each other, you know, the, the ghost of nationalism or the importance of talking about, you know, the, the coloniality of this war or imperial uh, character of the Russian state um, or decoloniality of knowledge that I guess all of us to a different extent are being engaged with. Um, and um, it brings, brings me to another memory um, of another therapeutic experience we just, just had a few days ago. I came from Warsaw. In Warsaw, there was um, a conference, two-day conference, called Aftermaths of the War. Uh, and that was the first time in this two months where I could meet in person, live, not on the screen, with, again, quite some of the colleagues from Ukraine, whom I love and miss, and some of them are even here in this Zoom, I see them. Uh, and that was an amazing experience on one hand, uh, because we were speaking Ukrainian finally, and I understood it was the first time in two months when I would publicly speak uh, in Ukrainian, because all the other public speaking and writing, which was happening you know, during the yeah, two months, uh, was English or English German. And being with the people there and you know, being able to hug them, being able to talk to them, to see their eyes, was actually something absolutely unbelievable, which I think a part of, uh, at least on my side, a part of a trauma of being outside of Ukraine in this time, uh, that the experiences that we have or that I have are very much mediated 
even you know as close as we can get you know with 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 reading or talking to people we love uh, to see information being able to connect to it in a different way than our colleagues from the west but it's still a mediated experience but seeing people in person and hearing how they speak uh, and how different they react to um, different kind of news that arrive at the moment because we were exactly in Warsaw on last last Thursday when uh, Kiev was warm again. That creates a different or opens a different sensitivity. And another important part about that experience was that um, among other friends and colleagues whom I met in, in uh, Warsaw was, uh, was uh, Ukrainian artist Aleftina Kahidze with uh, about whom and about her work I wrote extensively also in these last two months because she spent um, all the time in her house uh, in a Kiev suburb in, in Muzici drawing every day, drawing um, her experiences, experiences of the war and her real and imagined conversation with uh, Russian and Western artists and intellectuals about the war, about the nature of this war, uh, about Russian culture and canceling Russian culture and all that. So Aliftina left her house for the first time um, since the beginning of the war to go to Venice Biennale and then uh, to Warsaw. And before we met in the evening, she wrote me uh, that she would be very happy to see me and that from the experience in Venice, talking and meeting also friends in Europe, um, she felt um, that those who are outside the country uh, are in great pain. And then she wrote me, I will try to cure you. And that is a bit of a magic of an experience that people who survived and who lived through so much more than not just that I did, but I can even imagine, uh, they still have a, 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 not even a capacity, but um, a need to step closer and say, you know, I, I want to cure you because I feel that what you're going through is something um, different and maybe bigger than what I do. And I think this is an, an amazing quality of a Ukrainian society and, you know, what we do individually, what we do together, this care and cure and solidarity, which um, all started a long time ago, but became of a different quality, I think, during Maidan and after Maidan with the first beginnings of this war. And now um, creating this network of support without which I think the country would not survive probably, uh, at least on an emotional and a personal level. And um, I, I don't know, I keep thinking about it and I think it will really help and support me in all this, as uh, Nicola said, public relations that you know, I'm doing as we're all doing because the challenge of this public relations is that uh, we have to talk in a very different way to very different kinds of people. And one kind of people they really want to help and support. And I think I'm pretty lucky because in the Swiss situation, those people are many, uh, many colleagues, many cultural institutions, uh, many media, they really uh, quite full-heartedly want to help. They just don't know how. Uh, and they're actually, again, open enough to, to ask and to sort of show care. Um, but the people um, that are in Switzerland or in Europe might come to Switzerland, but also about people who are in Ukraine. But the other kind of people are people um, who care to a certain extent. Um, but, and there I will probably disagree Valeria, with you a little bit because those people are not necessarily thinking in terms of Russia propaganda or Russian mediated discourse about the war. Um, they are thinking in their own very much Western colonial approach to Ukraine and to Eastern Europe in general, uh, which is based basically still on the Cold War terms and still based on so much on anti-American, anti-imperialism, that the idea that anti-imperialism can be kind of twofold, it's not only against the, the US, but it can also be against Russia. And those stories, they, they, they meet somehow, and they're not necessarily contradicting each other. Um, with those people is, and I, I think most of uh, us here uh, had this experience, a lot of this experience, unfortunately, that's really hard to deal with. Uh, but I think I also found a little key of understanding uh, talking to a, also a 
German uh, living in Swiss colleague of mine who is a um, who is an activist who is running a a street magazine um, who is a journalist herself coming from a very sort of strong German left intellectual tradition because in our discussions and our fights um, which we had kind of a few she said that she's actually happy that in all this complexity of the situation especially about the, you know the heavy weapons delivery to Ukraine she doesn't have to make a decision and for me that was a little key that most of those people um, really don't have to make a decision and they don't understand what they say publicly what they print in media, what they say at the discussions, what they kind of uh, mention in, in, in a public talks, um, that those words matter, those arguments matter, those open letters matter. But basically what's behind them is this feeling, well, but I don't have to make a decision. You know, my government does, and I will just sort of just express what I have to express, understanding that, well, in any case, it's not my decision. So there are people dying and, uh, you know, the, the trouble which is happening, it's somewhere far away, but, you know, I'm just being with my intellectual position, but the responsibility is not on me, uh, which is also, I think, important trick to understand that many people uh, and also our colleagues absolutely respectful, respected and, and important. Um, they've grown in a situation for, for years, for decades, uh, where the decision making and actually understanding how fast the situation can change, the political, social situation can change, and how what you do or you don't do actually really does influence the situation and has a very practical and political and a personal impact. Um, and this is also, it's a different, um, it's a different tempo of life and different temporality. Um, with those people, they can, they can offer to, um, uh, you know, to write an article really fast, but then it will be published in a month and a half. And you say, well, but the situation changed already drastically. But in this world, it's, uh, you know, it's not a key argument. Or I remember I was a bit of, in a shock when I was uh, invited to a podium discussion in Zurich in the early days of March. And the discussion would be on the 20th of April. And I say, guys, how is it possible? I mean, come on, 20th of April, the war will be over by that time. Unfortunately, the war was not over. But it's also it's also different different um, tempo of of talking and understanding the the changes and then the 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 impact of the war on the human lives. Uh, and finally, referring to a question, Valeria, in my experience, um, I do mostly relate to personal stories. Also, a bit coming back to Aliftina and her care, and I do see that um, talking with uh, writing for different audiences in the European West, the personal stories and personal experiences um, help because something which people think they understand intellectually and they have completely frame framework they're set um, to, um, to understand or they think they understand when they go on the level, not just of awful stories in the media uh, or awful pictures from you know, Bucha or Mariupol, but very, small and personal experience of very concrete people um, who lost their houses, who lost their families, who lost their possibilities to, to talk or to work. Um, that, that does work, that does connect. And I think we should not um, forget that um, all the people we talk to or we work with or we write for, they're still human beings. And this moment of, of caring and curing um, is also part of our job. Thank you. Thank you so much for highlighting this humanistic aspect. I think it is very important for us to, to meet, to see and hear each other and, and cure each other by the very fact of talking and recognizing each other indeed. And uh, what, you put, what you mentioned is a very valid point that it's not always about being Russophile or somehow engage in some big uh, propaganda or other agendas, but often about being egocentric or just comfortable in their small world and stonewalling from this uncomfortable information coming from Ukraine, which they might not care that much about. And we still need to think how to break through this wall. 
And now, before turning to the last speaker, I want to remind our audience that you can use the chat box to post your questions. We are slowly running out of time, so I will do my best maybe to combine several questions, or we will see maybe we will take a bit longer to, to talk. I'm enjoying our discussion, and I use this opportunity to thank again uh, all of the speakers. And now I'm turning to Vitaly Chernetsky. We talked a lot about the European experience, and now I wonder what is happening in the States and in the North American academia generally. Um, we all, to a certain extent, think about decolonial, decolonization, but you are very well established as a theoretician, right, of the post-colonial approach. And as far as I see that uh, the post-colonial approach to Eastern Europe is, exists quite separately to the classical post-colonial approach, which is very much based on anti-Western resentment and quite sympathetic to Russia. I see that it's slowly changing, at least with post-colonial scholars in Eastern Europe. However, we've seen a parade of dubious statements by Western leftist intellectuals recently, be that Judith Butler or Noam Chomsky, or Jürgen Habermas that is widely debated. So I wonder, do you see any openings in uh, the post-colonial studies for the Ukrainian perspective to be seriously recognized and included? The floor is yours, Vitaly. Thank you for accepting the invitation and for being here. Thank you so much, Valeria. And thanks to all the colleagues who spoke before me and to all the audience members. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation today. And many important topics and, uh, were already brought up that and, uh, observations to which I can personally relate. I was especially moved uh, by Katerina just talking about the Liftina Kahidza as I hosted Katerina as an artist in residence here at the University of Kansas in the fall. And this was an opportunity to get to know this wonderful artist whom I first met, thanks to Katerina, uh, more than 20 years ago that you know, we are continuing this uh, wonderful collaboration. And indeed, her speaking from a personal experience has had a huge impact. And there are many people in the artistic community that she met here in the US in the fall are now uh, retranslating and reflecting and using that to uh, give a different dimension of an understanding of the war. Uh, as for the situation in the US, uh, there I think there are several different aspects. And speaking from personal experience, I can totally fully relate uh, to what several colleagues said before, that the first days of the war, I felt absolutely shell-shocked. Uh, my body was reacting violently. Uh, things were just not coming together. At the same time, I started receiving calls uh, from media, especially from local television stations here in the Kansas City area, who wanted to talk. And I granted all the interviews I could. The only interview I received to grant was Fox News, because I told them that uh, as long as Tucker Carlson, one of the notorious uh, show hosts, is continuing to regurgitate Putin talking points, I would not be appearing on the same channel but I agreed to interviews from all the others. The problem was that early on, it was more asking about how I feel. So it was almost uh, bordering on a pornography of suffering. So somehow uh, providing material for some sort of dubious emotional titillation for certain people. And it did feel uh, like a bit of an exploitative approach, especially when the journalist was trying to coax tears out of me. And as soon as the recording stopped, it was almost like when Harry met Sally, when uh, uh, Notorious sort of, you know, the famous Meg Ryan episode when she completely switches. I mean, I've had several experiences like that and it was a bit of an unpleasant feeling afterward. But uh, in terms of intellectual responses, I would say, Overwhelmingly, my personal experience has been positive in that there were many colleagues who were trying to reach out to fulfill the gaps in their knowledge to understand, who understood that uh, they were looking at the world, especially at uh, the territory of the former Russian Empire, including exclusively through the Moscow-centric lens. And, uh, it was the development of that feeling of otherness and solidarity that was especially welcome. There were, of course, folks who 
before then criticized me uh, those kind of approaches and frameworks. So I was really grateful, for instance, for Edita Boyanovska from Yale University, a colleague that many here know well for her critique of Russian imperial discourse. Uh, she invited me to give a talk at Yale, uh, helping to share the Ukrainian perspective uh, with uh, the audience there. And Yale, uh, while it has wonderfully Timothy Snyder and others in history, still does not have a Ukrainian presence in the Slavic languages and literatures department. So speaking within the Slavic department world, uh, in generally the more problematic uh, space would be not all, but some of the dominant, you know, Russian literature specialists who are really uh, having trouble uh, addressing the fact that uh, they're, you know, teaching uh, the, the familiar texts of Russian classics as if nothing happened is no longer possible. There are some who are trying to rethink how one can still continue teaching Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, but through a critical lens. But uh, the general sort of domination of the uh, you know, Russia-centric paradigm within uh, the field has not still be and fully uh, challenged. The challenge is happening and there are discussions and there are strong voices coming and it's great to have these kind of allies and the solidarity network and we are really grateful to all of them. And uh, there is of course a lot of voices of solidarity from uh, within the broader field of other colleagues of uh, non-imperial background, but also very importantly, uh, Russian colleagues who are understanding that this need to uh, yield the speaking space, but it creates a situation that uh, has its own pitfalls and complications and that there is the demand, please tell us everything we need to know, preferably in one hour, uh, and the large number of invitations to be the token Ukrainian representative on some sort of panels and so on and so forth. So this is where I found, and I'm, uh, if I have the privilege, I believe I am, I just wanted to show for a second this a wonderful cover of the anthology, I strongly recommend uh, the Routledge Handbook of Epistemic Injustice. And I'm going to stop the share. And just the very concept of epistemic injustice, I think is very important. It's uh, the meeting of political philosophy and ethics. And this is something that indeed has a strong presence in post-colonial studies because Gayatri Spivak and Candace Bolton speak uh, famously speaks of uh, epistemic violence that is being done towards the uh, colonized subjects. And uh, Walter Mignolo, one of the leading uh, decolonial theorists, talks about epistemic injustice and epistemic disobedience a lot in his writing. But uh, if we look at the uh, systematizing approaches. I mean, for instance, uh, the article by one of the co-editors of this vol volume, the philosopher Gail Polhouse, she talks about other things that are important part of this cluster. And one of them is uh, the question of epistemic trust, who is trusted to be the producer and deliverer of knowledge, and also epistemic exploitation. This is precisely the situation of being the, the token speaker. And this is where I can relate to, for example, a lot to the experience uh, within uh, um, social justice protests, for instance, of Slavists of color, who were then all asked to help enlighten the uh, folks who are not of color about their perspectives, about their exclusion from the field, about all the obstacles that they have said. And there's the inevitable situation of burnout that is uh, creating a huge problem. But we, in this uh, situation, of course, uh, all of us, uh, I think, you know, in uh, the field of Ukrainian studies uh, feel huge burnout too, but we somehow tr try to marshal, you know, all those last vapors in the engine and continue running and uh, indeed speaking out and uh, helping enlighten colleagues. But 
I think by complicating the situation by uh, indeed challenging uh, the perspectives uh, that uh, we see emerging, uh, like the defensive uh, posture of those who are entrenched in uh, the position of authority, who are used to uh, looking at uh, things from a certain Russia-centric worldview and who just feel right now sad that they can no longer travel in good conscience to Russia and uh, experience the things that they've really enjoyed. Um, so for many of them, it, this is um, s more of a feeling of inconvenience with guilt, but that guilt does not necessarily always translate in the seri into serious um, meaningful uh, efforts to restructure the field, uh, to reckon uh, with uh, the legacies of how the field of Slavic studies uh, was mostly Russian studies with everything else as an afterthought in most American universities uh, for the more than century of the existence of the field and how this is really a high time to change that. So this is not a simple process. This is a, uh, something that is generating a lot of uh, tension and friction, but it is moving and there are very practical steps being made. But here too, we see situations that some, uh, for instance, folks who were active as civil society activists after the revolution of dignity have experienced. So for instance, I know of colleagues who at uh, other universities have tried to create programs for scholars at risk and uh, bring in uh, colleagues from Ukraine. And at first there was huge enthusiasm and then the slowness of the university bureaucratic machine just overpowers and their labor is not acknowledged. And the percentage of the outcome is far from what it seemed two months ago was possible. And, uh, but nevertheless, we, we persist, uh, we still try and there are tangible results. Uh, there also is a huge problem of coordination where there are sometimes colleagues uh, who are able to get a goodwill of the university administration, but they do not necessarily have connections in Ukraine or sometimes there is the situation where the administration has a vetted uh, list. They need to have a vetted list of these uh, the so-called scholars at risk in order to be placed. And in the context of the war, this is not something that you know you can always create quickly on the fly. So the, all these purely practical challenges. As for the leftist uh, discourse and the. Uh, perspective of anti-imperialist means anti-American and therefore everything that is anti-American is uh, structurally becomes something that I support. This has been a problem, but far less so uh, lately. I think that uh, the uh, circles that strongly support that have really diminished in their size and in their power. And so those are uh, marginal voices, um, but the change is still going to take a long time, but change is happening and we see it in some places. So we there is a progress despite resistance of the entrenched system, just the structural resistance and resistance of certain stakeholders who are just very comfortable with the status quo ante situation and are not open to much change. But I think that overall, in terms of uh, the field in uh, the United States, I think the glass is rather half full than half empty. And one of the pleasant news in this, uh, not to make it about myself, uh, but 
Uh, I recently received a phone call from Gayatri Chakraborty Spivak for uh, participating in a plenary session at the next MLA convention, which will be in San Francisco. And I'm the only Slavist. So it's interesting that uh, this is the kind of uh, possibilities that open up tragically because of this war. We see uh, the strong demand, uh, for instance, for Ukrainian literature, that all the bookstores now all of a sudden, which never carried a Ukrainian book in the history, now feature not one, but multiple. But here too, we have the bottleneck situation where there is a sudden demand and you cannot churn out many books overnight. Uh, Creating books takes time. Academic presses are also notoriously slow. So we will probably have a big wave of important publications coming in half a year to a year. But uh, there have been some that have been able to mobilize and produce something in the pipeline relatively quickly, but now we're still mostly relying on what was already in the pipeline before this new escalation of the war started. Anyway, thank you so much for this opportunity. And thank you again, Valeria, for bringing us together. My pleasure. Thank you so much. That was illuminating, Vitaly. And thank you for bringing uh, in this case with the invitation from Guy to Chakravorty Spivak. I think I saw a post by you, but I did not ask you directly. But I think that's indicative exactly of these changes that may be not that drastic as we would want them to be, but they're there and we should uh, appreciate them as they're happening. So we ran out of our time. Uh, I would suggest that those who need to leave may do so, but maybe we can take another 10, 15 minutes to, uh, to have the closure, so to speak, to maybe to talk about like in a more free way. And um, is that okay for all the participants? Would you be generous with your time to, to give us some, some more time? So if anyone wants to, to ask a question, either speaking up, then you can just raise your hand in this reactions uh, box, or you can write it in chat. So if I have surprisingly a question to myself, uh, what kind of statement by Judith Butler I had in mind, I could not find immediately this recent interview uh, where um, the title of the interview is that I hope that the Russian soldiers would put guards down and would refuse to follow the like orders from their offices. So um, the whole interview is made up in a very interesting way. No, no blatant uh, distorted sort of statement are there, but the whole focus of attention is definitely not on the Ukrainian side. So it, it gives a very specific impression of the stance of Judith Butler. I don't know if any of colleagues read that interview. Um, also, I received a question anonymously in direct message. So if any of you would want to address that one, how this full war, uh, full scale invasion uh, changed the urgency of the language matter? Because since we are talking about Ukrainians abroad, uh, that many refugees coming in particular to Czech Republic speak Russian. On the one hand, the full scale invasion makes abundant any uh, colonial claims like culture and language because we see a direct ag aggression, but at the same time, some people are very sensitive to that. So what do you think if anything has changed in terms of the language matter? I can give you. I can give you just example. It's not. Uh, um, I didn't analyze this issue, but I uh, have a very live example because uh, my my wife recollected the story when uh, she entered uh, Poland. She traveled by train from Kiev with a refugee crowd, and um, uh, there was a man uh, from somewhere from Kharkiv, from East Ukraine, uh, who was so uh, moved by the very warm uh, acceptance, but very warm uh, meeting. Uh, with Poles, Polish volunteers greeted uh, Ukrainian refugees uh, with uh, coffee and pizza and accommodation and transportation. 
And he exclaimed a very, a very significant, uh, uh, made very significant statement. He, he, he exclaimed, what это настоящие братья, не то, что эти русские. So for me, this statement is very significant because uh, he wrapped uh, the new experience into the old formula, into the old cliche, which uh, signifies, which means that uh, people first of all acquire a new experience, but still they lack the proper language. They cannot express this um, new experience in new form. They still use old cliches, as a brotherhood and so on. So I, I feel it's very graphical, it's very typical, and uh, which means that probably we, we, uh, the, the, the language issue would uh, lag behind the new experience. That's what I, what I mean. But, but inevitably, new experience was, would change language practices and uh, the very attitudes to, to the language. So this is what I, I, I predict, what I presume. So much. Thank you. That was a very illustrative case, I believe. And also, we have now uh, a question in the chat box from Isabella Kalinovska Blackwood, probably addressed to Vitaly uh, how we can make this moment last that post Soviet voices are included in post colonial discussion. So, what can be done about that? Well, uh, we try to seize the moment and advocate that this is needed and this is a there's both short-term and long-term work and this is a chance i mean there is often that means that there is a lot of pressure uh of on those moments but uh, there is uh more of that uh outreach happening and i think that we do have uh this kind of uh momentum uh, now uh, the question is uh, how to uh, how to relate and how to yes seize this moment productively. I don't think I have uh, a very elaborate answer beyond saying that just we um, realize that those kind of pressures. But you know this is something that a lot of uh, Again, Ukrainian writers have, you know, written uh, about this before. I'm thinking of both Oksana Zabushko and Yuri Andrukhovich, for example, writing a lot about this in the 1990s, when all of a sudden, yes, you are there in a public situation, you need to speak. But in Zabushko's case actually is instructive here because realizing that Ukrainian voices were missing from a dialogue between uh, American and you know Russian and East European writers. She was invited as an afterthought to a conference at Rutgers University. That was a continuation of the Lisbon conference, a famous notorious one of 1990. And she did use that moment and she did make a lasting impression, uh, at least in terms of waves continuing. So every such uh, moment is something where we take uh, the chance and uh, speak coherently and loudly. And uh, we need to make sure that in appealing to those audiences, we speak, we, we yes, just like Katarina said, we humanize it, we give concrete examples. But I also think it's important to bring uh, parallels to appeal to texts from the discourse, which is why, for instance, uh, in before we went live stream, I was mentioning uh, Ngugi's essay on the abolition of the English department, which is why um, Katarina and I collaborated on translating Said's culture and imperialism and bringing this to Ukrainian audience. As, and then this also was an opportunity to engage with folks on the in the global post-colonial studies so there is i think um, a change in that respect but uh, that is in there is still a problem uh that professor kalinovska blackwood rightly formulated in that there seems to be more eagerness eagerness on our side to embrace this than from the folks of the more established post-colonial studies to reciprocate but when they do reciprocate, we just uh, seize that momentum and I guess do the best we can to make a forceful argument. 
if Valeria allows me, I will uh, jump in with a short um, comment or kind of follow up on More than welcome. what Vitaly said, because I think it's very important also on Ukrainian side, um, not just be eager and willing, but really have a discussion uh, about, you know, decoloniality as a part uh, of a discourse in the artistic field and literature and in the academia. And until recently in Ukraine, uh, it wasn't the case. And I'm actually very happy that it's rapidly changing now uh, over the course of two months. I would be more happy if there would be a different reason that we are where we are, right? So we're dealing with what we're dealing. And I think it's, it's of immense importance that those questions that also we were discussing today are becoming more and more kind of on the agenda in the cultural intellectual sphere in general. Uh, now the, the next step is also that we're not just talking about it, but that we are starting to talk and work with these issues more in a more informed way. And um, I say it also because uh, I was working on, on the project on exhibition and serious publications in, in Lviv to um, open in August this year um, on decolonization of knowledge and the project would be called Organic Communities. And we start, when we started working on it last year, uh, the idea of you know, decolonial thinking and decolonization of knowledge was something so exotic to most of the colleagues in Ukraine. It was like, what are you even talking about? I mean, come on, this is not an issue. This is not important in Ukraine nowadays. So many other things are important. And now I'm thinking that this, this uh, ontology that we wanted to translate and publish, you know, if we did it a few months ago, um, it would be so on time. But you know, we didn't. The book was supposed to be published in June. So we're a little bit late. But I do hope that when the war is over, um, we will not forget about those issues that we're talking about now. I mean, there will be many, many other challenges on you know, cultural and intellectual agenda, but that we still remember that those discussions on decoloniality in Ukraine and Eastern Europe, they need to happen also inside Ukraine. And then from that position, we can also start talking and engaging in the discussions on different levels with our colleagues in Eastern Europe, in Western Europe and, and globally. Thank you, Katerina. Yulia? Uh, I just want to continue what uh, Katya said and what Vitaly said, because the shifts, uh, these changes in the perception of uh, post-colonial theory or decolonial theories, uh, they, they are really huge. Because I remember when I was writing my book, and it was uh, many years ago, it was like 2009, 2010, and I was presenting these thoughts at the conferences, and a lot of people, especially from Ukraine, were reacting that we are not post-colonial, we have nothing with colonial theories to, to do. The, it was really kind of a signal that, oh no, it's like, and now we are all talking about decolonial, post-colonial, and it's amazing how it shifted. And even Katya just mentioned that it was two years ago that if the, the people were not really uh, accepting this decolonial theory, but now everyone is just uh, speaking about the decolonization of knowledge and uh, etc. So I think that these changes are not from outside, they are inside Ukraine so that we can see it like um, in both ways. Yes, thank you, Yule. I very much support the idea that once we have this like huge increase in the interest to the Ukrainian society at large, that we should now make some conscious effort to structure it, maybe through some networks to for more like meaningful distribution of knowledge or some frameworks, because right now it's quite um, sporadic and then also uh, at times mutually controversial. I, I can just give you anecdotal evidence from my own life that in late February, I was contacted alongside with a handful of other Ukrainian scholars by a German colleague saying that the Daad meeting would be happening, how they should react to the full-scale invasion. And while I responded that you should start seriously thinking about decoupling Ukrainian studies and Russian studies to enhance your expertise on the region, basically, then my colleague, also a Ukrainian, writes, yeah, but you should also think about supporting Russian scholars because they are now discriminated heavily. You know, so if we are promoting these sort of narratives, how would you imagine what kind of reaction would be on the other side? Um, yeah, so that's kind of an open-end question that, um, that so far it looks very uh, controversial to me at least. Oh, we have another 
a question about the capacity of intellectuals to influence respective societies and through that respective governments and the decision making on the state level. And also a question that was a question from Tatiana Shitsova and another one from Yulia Bidenko. Um, to Katerina, what is your personal attitude to projects or initiatives supposed to unite Ukrainian and Russian scholars at the moment? So whoever feels like starting answering either of those questions, please go forward. I wouldn't call this, this, this question sensitive. I would call this question infuriating, but I guess, um, yeah, we all more or less know about it. <laughs> What I, I would say is that you know, there, are, there are issues of ethics and there are issues of indeed changing the uh, the paradigms of uh, vision. So uh, just uh, in uh, our field, I mean, some of it has to do with old narratives uh, or organization of the field of Slavic and East European studies by linguistic principle rather than, you know, cultural. And uh, so uh, they have not read, you know, I guess, uh, Shabalov on the history of the Ukrainian language and that, you know, the, the theories about uh, how Ukrainian language is supposedly so very close to Russian, uh, indeed uh, not a linguistic fact, but, you know, is one of the imperial narratives. Um, but yes, uh, this is something where uh, we need to appeal to different colleagues, and sometimes those are very well-meaning colleagues who, however, um, do not understand the situations where certain things are re-traumatizing. And uh, yes, um, I have we have had a situation on here on campus where several protests i mean at the university is a secular university but near the university are various religious organizations of like, and different protestant groups like lutheran and methodist and others wanted to organize a prayer meeting for ukrainians and russians to support them at the time of war and I did not know this. I found out about this from one of our Ukrainian students. And we wrote um, all of us individual letters to those uh, Protestant you know, pastors saying that this is uh, not a well thought through thing. This is like bringing uh, relatives of the rape victim and a rapist in one room. And the relatives of the rapist might be very nice people and also condemning the crime, but just bringing them together in one space is uh, disrespectful to those who are the victims. And they fortunately understood, canceled that event, organized another one, which was fully in support of Ukraine. It was not as well attended as we had hoped, but at least there was not a, uh, that misguided one uh, was averted. But uh, these kind of situations happen uh, a lot and you know they often happen not out of maliciousness, but out of ignorance. And uh, try, we, we try our, but if, no matter how painful and traumatic it is, we try and uh, often it is important uh, to uh, help people sort of come out of their perspective and look at things differently because yes, a lot of it comes just from intellectual laziness and being used uh, to looking at things a certain particular way. Uh, I unfortunately need to leave our meeting because I have to teach very shortly, but I wanted to use this opportunity to, to thank uh, Valeria again and all the other amazing colleagues who I had a privilege of joining uh, this panel with. And Lupai Matsuskalu will continue our fight. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us, Vital, and for all your inputs here. Thank you. Um, I still see some raised 
hands and I'm I find myself in a very difficult position because I do feel that I'm abusing you, uh, your time a bit and your willingness to, to engage, but probably we can uh, do that shortly. Yulia? Yeah, many thanks. Uh, um, I just want to explain my position because I can see that Katerina maybe was a little bit insulted by my question and I really appreciate Dr. Chernetsky uh, for his position because I also face an oftenly with a, such a situation when some of uh, let's say organizers of panels uh, uh, panels or uh, let's say conferences they try to bring together Ukrainian scholars and Russian ones and uh, me personally, I refuse uh, to, to participate in such events, but still, uh, I think this position uh, should be also promoted, uh, you know, by Ukrainian scholars, especially those who uh, well reputably abroad. So it is really, for me, it's really trauma because I'm from Karazin University, which was uh, partly destroyed by Russian. And uh, when they want me to, to be in the same panel with those who, let's say, from the institutions who, who signed this uh, application by uh, Russian uh, rectors, uh, which uh, supported uh, the war. For me, it's painful. And I think that it's also a kind of a battlefield for Ukrainian scholars as well. It's not the Russophobic, but but still, <laughs> I think that we need to to show that it is kind of a sensitive question for for our scholars at the moment currently. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for explaining yourself, Yule. Your your position is perfectly understandable and makes a lot of sense. I think just Professor Cherneski gave us a broader perspective because when uh, the question is posed in a universal matter, then we need some nuanced and balanced approach. Uh, thanks again, Viktor. Yeah, first of all, I wanted to uh, say goodbye because I had to go as well. But for saying goodbye, I just wanted to add something on that about Russians. Uh, you know, I've been mostly addressing since, you know, the full-scale invasion started. I've been trying to address people in Central Asia a lot, explaining to them Ukraine from inside because, well, I've seen a lot, you know. But there was one time when I actually tried to address some people in Russia, and I'm talking about indigenous people in Russia. Uh, Russia is still a colonial empire. It has more than 20 colonies, which are part of it. Well, of course, uh, there is a room for debate whether they should be considered colonies, but I do consider them colonies, and I'm talking about republics of Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, you name it, Altai, Buryatia, whatever. And um, mm, I once received this interesting request from my friend in Kiev who asked me like if I can find a translator from Buryat and Altai language for him, uh, which I managed to find because I remembered that I actually know people uh, from these republics who are very much resistance, resistant to what Russia is doing. Uh, I've then started researching, you know, what kind of independence movement have been going on in Russia in uh, this republics, uh, and I found some interesting stories about, you know, the Tatarstan independence movement, uh, and all, all of all of this was suppressed heavily, especially since Putin came to power. Uh, even slight talks, you know, like <laughs> about any possibility of uh, uh, becoming independent from Russia would be immediately persecuted. But maybe we should think about you know, somehow addressing this part of population of Russian Federation, because uh, uh, I also also recently read a really interesting text about how indigenous people in Russia started, some of them, distancing themselves from Russia, who they don't want to be associated with Russians. And maybe this is a chance for us to do some really interesting work. It will be difficult, it will be risky, it will be maybe dangerous in some cases for these people, uh, but this uh, can definitely weaken uh, Russia from inside, and I'm currently thinking about it, and I hope that uh, we will come to something interesting. But uh, but this this is the part of of of, uh, of Russian population that I would be very happy to find, you know, the ways to work with. Thank you, Victor. 
Thank you. That's indeed very important. And I think that uh, I will use this opportunity to close this conversation. We've been working for two hours now, and I completely agree with Katerina that it had a very strong therapeutical effect to, to meet and talk as we seem to speak the same language, uh, not necessarily the Ukrainian one. And I, I love how easily we switch to English, seeing that we have a quite an international audience. So once again, I want to extend my cordial thanks to my distinguished colleagues for participating in this event and to our audience for your engaged listening and for your questions. Thank you all. Have a nice evening. Thank you so much.